Hello. Hello, hello. Oh, oh, just Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon, Amy Kanina. Good afternoon, Sophia. Good afternoon, Ash. Good afternoon, Ashley. Good after. Well, okay, it's happening. It's happening. Good afternoon, my board that just left. Good afternoon, Sophia. Good afternoon, Jamalette. Good afternoon, Diana. Good afternoon, Jalen. Good afternoon, Ashley. Good afternoon, Brianna. Good afternoon, Chloe. Good afternoon, Shakia. Good afternoon from Stephen. Top of the afternoon, Abdel. And you got it. It all worked, Abdel, right? Like, okay. Yeah. On Wednesday, right? Okay. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, good. Uh, who else? Uh, good afternoon, Sarah. Wait. Yeah. Good afternoon, Sarah. Afternoon, Jasmine. Oh, it's not even a good afternoon for Jasmine. It's just like an afternoon. We'll find out in an hour if it's good or bad. Good afternoon, Brooke. And here comes Nicholas. Okay. Who else did I? Uh, good afternoon, Samuel C. And I also do see Samuel A. J. Oh, good afternoon. All right. And we're going to start again. And of course, I don't see my board. Um, Dale sets into the setting setness. Um, good afternoon, Nicholas. Good afternoon, Nicholas. Okay. Oh. Okay. Diana, and by the way, yes, I really do know who Ashley is now. I mean, she thinks I doesn't. She thinks I doesn't, but I does. Um, okay. Hey, good afternoon, Jocelyn. I know who you are in a totally different way, in a 2D way. Um, Shakia, who else have I not? All right. I think that's our David. I think, oh, Jasmine. Did I say Jasmine? I'm sorry. Hello, Jasmine. Or did Jasmine say me? Okay. Let's get to work. Let me get the board back again. We're just going to keep going, going, going. I've got a good afternoon, Samuel. Thank you. Um, Samuel A. J. O. Um, a J. O. Um, all right. All right. We're going to, oh, and good afternoon, David. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, there's more people coming. Okay. We're going to get, keep. So again, I've gotten now today, technically, the homework two was extended. I got some drafts from some people. In fact, I think some of them got it back. I think actually everybody that I got a draft from before class. They got something back for me. Some people are very far along in it. Some people are less far along. Hopefully we're going to make more progress today and help you more, blah, blah, blah. Um, but again, what we're, we're trying to get better at two things here as the class progresses. We're trying to get better at the material, period. Like we're trying to learn the material so that you can do these things better and better. But we're also trying to get better at getting better at things without getting better at them. It, if you know what I'm saying, right? Like I want more and more drafts from people. Yes, I want longer drafts and more material as I give you more material and more help with how to do these drafts for sure. And that's why the clock is never running out and it's never too late and all that. I mean, or it's not too late for a long time. But I also want to see more and more attempts from people showing that they know what to do even when they don't quite know what to do, right? And a quick word on that is please, 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 like some of the drafts I got from you guys were very good. Like if you already got in the 30s on that homework, that means like, oh, maybe there's an error here or there, or maybe I'm missing a diagram. But if you're already in the 30s, like you're good to go for sure. If you got in the 20s, it means totally respectable. Like we're making progress. I see you, you see me. Um, but probably there's still a bunch of things blank or something like that, like that you haven't gotten to, which is fine. None of this is judgment, but just factually, if you're in the 20s, like there's still more to do on that homework. If you haven't gotten any points yet, then there's a lot more to do on it. There's still time, blah, blah, blah. But let me say to all of you, please, the math methods homework, which has like a lot of math in it, it's so mathy that for some of you, it might seem like this five-step problem solving method doesn't apply or doesn't apply as easily. No, I can, it definitely does. More specifically, this homework, I did not provide you with a diagram, but that's all the more reason you want to provide me with at least one diagram. You want to get in the habit of turning equations or words into pictures, like for real, for real. It's probably one diagram that you'll refer to a million times for the first seven exercises. Like I don't need a million diagrams, but at least one. What would the diagram be if I just gave you a raw differential equation or a raw cosine function? How about a cosine graph? Like for real, like give me a cosine graph and the key to a cosine graph is the shape. Like I want to see the shape, but I want to see axes labeled. Like show me what's being, like it's really a, a good graph, has a shape, has axes labeled 
and has at least one kind of relevant or, 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 um, or a significant um, point labeled. Ideally two, so you can get a sense of scale, but at least one point other than zero, zero labeled, like a Y intercept or something. Now, and I'll even go a step further on the cosine graph. Like it might seem like there's no picture possible, but those first five exercises of homework two, which we're gonna be going over more now, I think we started them already. Um, a, a cosine graph would put a lot in perspective here. And in the cosine graph, if you draw it right, if you draw a shape, and label axes, like I'm not saying plot a million points like by hand, but the general shape, the labeled axes, and that omega term, which we're really going to talk about today, uh, you'll have a lot more help from today of what to do with it for sure. But it's something that definitely can be seen in a graph. And you'll know that you really understand omega once you can see what it's referring to in the general picture or size of cosine. So I'm encouraging you, like, you know, it doesn't matter whether you've done it already or not, a cosine graph where you make it clear what omega is referring to, you know, by reference to a sig one significant point or two significant points, oh, that would be enormously helpful to you and to me. Okay, end of that. I'm going to, the board keeps disappearing. I'm going to bring the board back, but we're going to keep going with this cosine business. Oh, and the derivatives. Oh, and, and yeah, it, sorry, and derivatives. We did this quick thing on the chain rule last time. I'm going to, you know, we're going to continue be, to be practicing these derivatives going in both directions, differentiating or integrating or solving differential equations. Um, you know, again, the bad news is like, we got to get down with this calculus stuff now. I don't really think that's bad news, but maybe the scary news. But But the good news is, let me also make clear, we're doing the calculus for the purpose of physics, particular physics phenomena. So I'm trying to unpack particular functions and particular differential equations. They're particular. I mean, they're specific. Don't think, I mean, and I know you're, don't think that I'm unpacking this differential equation as an example of 11,000 other ones that you have to be all dexterous with. And don't think that like now I'm expecting you to see across the board how to do a whole bunch of differential equations and that if you were to have an exam, <clears throat> like suddenly you'd have all these new ones. It's not that. I'm trying to get inside the details of these differential equations. I'm trying to have you understand differential equations enough to understand these, the ones that are coming up in physics here. And similarly, with differentiating and integrating, the rules we're emphasizing are the ones we need. So you do need to get comfortable with sine and cosine and chain rule, but don't think that this means that next thing you know, we have also integration by parts and also like the quotient rule and also that, no, it's like, it's what we need that we're dealing with. So you do want to get comfortable with chain rule. You do want to get comfortable with cosines. Why am I saying this now? Because I did notice in some of the homeworks, it seemed like people could do first derivatives, but then they stopped at second derivatives, which was slightly interesting to me because a second derivative, you just do the exact same thing. It occurs to me as I'm talking that perhaps that happened because we had gotten as far as taking the first derivative in this class. And then maybe that's where the class stopped. So people were using class material, which is great. But all right, so we'll progress further today. But once you take the first derivative of a function, if you know what you just did, then to take the second derivative, you do that same thing again. I mean, you iterate. Uh, so all right, so we'll watch that happen today, I guess. Um, okay. So where are we? Okay, okay, okay. Um, this is where we're, I keep, you might notice that something similar is appearing on the front board, like every class, partly because we never fully finish it and partly because we have to emphasize it and repeat it, that drill it in that much. Um, um, so this is where we're going today. I'm going to go, I'm going to apply this back to homework two in a second, but let me make a general here. Let me summarize again where we've been, because it's been a week. We've been saying this.
everything we've been doing right now, all this math and everything, it's all about this question right here on the board. I'm just changing the view, all which originally came from question nine on homework one, but is now blowing up into like our life topic. Okay. The fundamental thing is given F equals negative KX and given F net equals MA, what is X as a function of T, right? That's like our focus right now. And what we've been saying, and, and tell me if you want me to go back on that board, but what we're saying is fine, if, but you've seen this before, but you want to be really facile with this. We're saying if F net equals MA and F equals negative KX, right? The only F is negative KX. Therefore, we're saying negative X equals MA. But we are saying that by definition, A is the second derivative of X with respect to T. So the situation that we've been looking at, that we are looking at, is this, right? The physics said F net equals MA and F equals negative KX. That's the physics. And the physics leads us to want to know what's X as a function of T. So then if we start algebraically putting together the statements of physics, the GDPs, the step threes, right? We ended up seeing, oh, what we've got mathematically is this, right? We th This is the differential equation that we landed on. Whoops, sorry. The physics brought us to this. It's not like we were, I don't know how to change that. Okay. It's not like we're looking to, to do differential equations, but the physics brought us to this differential equation. It's called a differential equation because it, it, it tells us that some derivative of a dependent variable with respect to its independent variable, some derivative of a function of, of a variable is a function of the dependent variable rather than the independent variable. Again, this is a differential equation because what you're seeing on the left side is some kind of derivative of X with respect to T. And what you're seeing on the right side is X rather than T. That's what makes this a differential equation. So then we started saying, okay, how, we got to solve it. We got to find some function of X that meets this requirement that when we differentiate it twice gets us this, right? Okay, that's what we've been doing. So now I want to slow down. A, so what we so what we did was we guessed. What we've been doing is what well, what I'm saying the method is conjecture and check, guess and check. Conjecture and ver verify, I should say. Conjecture and verify, guess and check. Same thing. That's the method we've been doing. Now, the beginnings of homework two, what we started going over last time and what I'm going to go back to today, in the homework two, it takes a guess and it walks you through what it means to check that guess. And the way you check that guess is by differentiating. And it's trying to show you both, trying to remind you how to differentiate, but it's also trying to remind you what you do when you get your derivatives at the end. Like, what do you do? You look at whether the derivatives yielded what the equation says they should yield, right? And we're going to go back to that practice. It takes some practice. But what I want to back up on today that you might have been wondering or that might still be confusing whether you're consciously thinking it or not. What I want to back up today is like, where did we get our conjecture in the first place? I gave some arguments, but I didn't, I didn't lay down a very clear path to how we got the conjecture. Now, there is no 100% clear path to how to get a conjecture. That's why it's a conjecture, right? You cannot literally derive a guess. If you could, it wouldn't be a guess, right? But you can build a guess from past experience, from education, and some from rational thought. So... So I want to show you today. So before I go back to homework two, I want to show you where our particular thing that we keep trying, where it came from, okay?
So where did we come? Where would you get this guess in the first place? And, and I, my guess, I'm not writing it down yet because I'm showing you where it came from. The guess I'm talking about is X equals A or X naught, whatever you want to call X equals A cosine square root of K over MT, right? This, this, like that's the thing that you're one way or another you're testing in the homework and that I keep using and that you used in the lab, this elaborate cosine function, right? It keep, we keep trying to show ourselves that it works. And we keep trying to show ourselves that other things don't work. And if there's a big takeaway so far in the class right now, it's that the solution to the, that harmonic oscillation can be described by a differential equation. And the solution to that equation is a very specific cosine function. That is a takeaway. Like you ultimately want to know X equals X naught cosine square root of K over M times T or something like that. But where did I get it from? Okay, well, first of all, this is where diagrams are helpful. If I think, if I'm trying to figure out X as a function of T for a oscillator, for a mask going back and forth on the spring, right? The mask starts somewhere. It doesn't start at zero. If it started at zero, it would never go anywhere. It starts somewhere. It has some position. Sorry, so X is measured in meters. T is measured in seconds. When we're going back and forth, on the when we think about it, and when we did it in the lab, like for three weeks, which is like why we did, we we start the mass at some position called X naught. It starts as time progresses. It goes in toward the equilibrium, passes through the equilibrium, goes to some point, you know, equally on the other side, turns around, comes back to the equilibrium, keep, and et cetera, et cetera, keeps cycling back and forth. First of all, I'm just trying to say quickly, because I know I've said this before, if you just picture the data that, if you picture in your mind or you look experimentally what the data says for something that's going back and forth and back and forth, the smoothest, simplest way to, the smoothest, simplest possible way to describe real world natural oscillation would be a cosine, something that we recognize as a cosine graph. Why am I saying cosine, not sine? I mean, well, they are interchangeable. I could say so sine if I'm willing to adjust it correctly. But the thing is that sine starts at zero, zero. The sine of zero is zero. I think it's more direct and more convenient, more clear for my first guess to be cosine because I'm starting at some value other than zero, right? So first of all, Um, so first of all, so this doesn't prove that cosine's right, but it's why I would guess cosine because it's the simplest, smoothest function I know that goes back and forth and back and forth in the, in the way that the mass seems to be. And please notice, I'm not just saying it's simplest, smoothest possible. Like very quickly. I could make a graph of straight lines going back and forth, right? I could guess something simpler than cosine. I could guess that would be something that's going backward, then going forward, then going backward, then going forward, right? That would be an even simpler guess, but it's... It's too simple to be possible. It's, it's not the simplest possible guess. It's the simplest conceivable guess. It's too simple to be possible. Why? Because it's not smooth. What do I mean? I mean, if I were to guess, rant, 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 then I'm guessing something that's moving back at a constant velocity, right? At a constant velocity. And then 
in no time at all, all of a sudden grinds through a halt and flips its velocity all the way. Like, in other words, it's going like negative 30 miles an hour. It's going 30 miles an hour to the south, 30 miles an hour to the south, 30. And then all of a sudden, in no time whatsoever, it transfer, it changes to 30 miles an hour to the north. It, it somehow goes through all the values, negative 29, negative 28, negative 27, negative 26, and zero, and all the positive values, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and uh, turns all the way around in no time at all. Like that's what that jagged point at the bottom would be, right? That jagged point at the bottom would represent, or, 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 or let me put another, way. this graph, if I go like this, uh, 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 that graph is continuous. It's continuous. It didn't skip any position values. That would indicate a, an object that went through every possible position and then every possible position and every possible position. But if you made a graph of its derivatives, it would be skipping derivatives. Those corner points are not points of discontinuity, but they are points of non-differentiability. I'm saying that this thing would have to skip from a positive velocity to a negative velocity in no time whatsoever. It would have to have an infinite acceleration, right? So it's not smooth. It's too smooth. It's too unsmooth to be natural or real. We want to function. If a function is going to change its velocity, it's got to have an acceleration. If it's going to change its acceleration, it's going to have to have a jerk. If it's going to change its jerk, it's going to have to, et cetera, et cetera. And what we thought of when we thought about questions six, seven, eight, and nine, et cetera, we realized to something to continually, continuously go back and forth and back and forth forever for it to continuously change its positions from positive to negative to positive, it must be changing its velocities from negative to positive to negative. To, and it must be changing its accelerations from negative to positive to negative. It's got to go on. So it's got to be infinitely smooth only function I know that does that is like a, or one of the simplest functions I know that do that are not sawtooths, they're cosines and sines. That's why these functions are beautiful. They're smoothly going back and forth. As you go toward a maximum position, you go to a minimum speed. As you go to a maximum kinetic energy, you go to a minimum potential energy. As you go to a maximum acceleration, you go to a minimum jerk, et cetera, et cetera. It's smooth. It's a very beautiful thing. It's capturing all the, anyway, whatever. So I'm guessing, first of all, I'm just guessing cosine one because i'm looking from the, at the data from the lab and the data is going back and forth and back and forth and cosine is a function i know that does that second of all i'm saying to myself it's got to be a function that continually generates derivatives it can't be a function that eventually runs out of derivatives so the derivative of cosine is negative sine the derivative of negative sine is negative cosine the derivative of negative cosine is sine it keeps generating derivatives. So that's a good guess. So I'm saying, so I'm guessing cosine doesn't prove anything, but that's where the guess came from. And that's why we do labs first as physicists, you know, and then, and then, and then think about things. So my guess so far So I guess some type of cosine, but what do I mean when I say type? I mean, cosine is the general form that I'm guessing, but there's going to be more details to it. And I have to guess those. Here's what I mean. And you, you've seen me write it like this way once before, but I'm going to guess that X equals something times cosine of something times T. Why the, okay, it's some kind of cosine, but there's going to be details. I think there's going to be constant terms before the T and before the cosine. Why? I'll show you.
Okay, remember, this isn't just raw math. This is science. We're trying to describe a phenomenon that we think is happening in the measurable world of space and time, right? Like this all is supposed to correspond to measurements that we either observed or literally made in the lab. So you can't take the cosine. So we have to think about units of measurement. And you can't take the cosine of a second. You, I mean, you literally can't. You can only take the cosine of a radian or, or of a degree if you want, but that's clunky. Um, and we're more advanced than that at this point. So you, um, so you can only take the cosine of something measured in something like radians. So there's got to be something Here, there's got to be some constant here that's measured in radians per second in order to cancel out the seconds of the time unit and leave radians. And it's got to be a constant because I already have my two variables taken care of. And if you think about graphs and functions and stuff like that, what I'm really just saying when I say there's got to be some constant here, I'm also saying there's got to be a scaling factor. And the scaling factor might be the number one, like, okay, maybe like a, a, a pure simple cosine graph is a cosine graph that's just literally X equals cosine of T, right? It, uh, that's, that's the shape. If, if we were to put a number before T, we don't change the fact that it's a cosine. We change something about the cosine shape. Like we squeeze it or we stretch it or we translate it or something, something, right? But, but so what I'm saying is there's no reason, if we're looking for a general answer, there's no reason to assume that, um, that T is just being multiplied by one. Like that might be the case, but it could be multiplied by anything. And that would still be a cosine graph. So there's got to be something. We got to take into account that there's some constant here before the t that's measured in radians per second, um, uh, and cancels out those units. We could call it whatever we want, but I'm going to call it omega. I'm going to and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, you could call it whatever you want, but with the better, traditionally physicists use a letter that looks like W, but is actually the lowercase Greek letter omega. They use omega because omega sort of reminds them of V um, as in velocity. And this term, whatever's going here, this constant term is some kind of rate. It's not velocity, but it's like a velocity in that it's the number of somethings per unit second. If that, okay, actually, yeah, I'm gonna turn the, well, I'm going to get into more detail about that in a moment. I just want to fill in the other constant too, so you're not left hanging. But but um, it's you can call it whatever you want, but I'm going to call it omega because I want to because everybody else does, and I want to signal to myself that this thing is some kind of rate um, in time. This is a measurement of how many radians we're we're um, passing through or undergoing per unit time. I'll be more about specific about that in a second, but let me also get this other blank. This other blank has to be in some kind of units. When you take the cosine of something measured in radians, what you spit out is a pure number between one and negative one, right? When you take the cosine of something, the output is a pure number. It doesn't have any units, but we want our output to be measured in meters this thing is supposed to be telling us for any given time, where is the mass? How many meters from the equilibrium position is the mass displaced? That's what this function is supposed to be saying, right? So, so we're gonna get some number between one and negative one when the cosine is finished doing its work. We're gonna first of all wanna take that number and multiply it by meters. We're gonna multiply by some number that's measured in meters so that in the end, it's not just one, the quantity, it's one meter or something. But then I say to myself, I can go a little bit further. The greatest, um, the greatest output that cosine is ever gonna produce is the number one and the least is gonna be negative one. 
Well, I already know from my spring, I already know from my diagram and from the lab that the, the mass on the spring is not restricted to fluctuate between one meter and negative one meters. It's going to fluctuate, oscillate between whatever number of meters it started at and the opposite of that on the other side, right? If it like in our problem in homework one, if it starts at 0.15 meters, from equilibrium, then it's going to fluctuate, oscillate forever between 0.15 and negative 0.15 meters, right? So if you think about it, if we want to put some constant here in this term that's measured in meters, and we could call it anything. We can call it anything, but we actually already know its name. The name that we want to put here is X naught, or you could call it A for amplitude. Same thing. X naught means the initial displacement from equilibrium measured in meters. Amplitude means the maximum displacement from equilibrium measured in meters. It, it, it turns out for an oscillator, they're one and the same, assuming it started from rest. So I'm saying, I'm saying cosine is going to spit out a value that's oscillating smoothly between negative one and one. Whatever that value is that it spits, a pure value between negative one and one, it's going to spit that out. And then we just want to multiply that. We want to take the whole graph and stretch it by our amplitude as measured in meters. So that, for example, when, when t equals zero, We'll take the cosine of some constant times zero. I still don't know much about that constant, but whatever it is, it's going to be multiplied by zero. So when t equals zero, we'll take the cosine of zero. The cosine of zero is one. So then one will be multiplied by x naught measured in meters. And so the answer will be that at t equals zero, x equals x naught. You see what I'm saying? Like we already know just from being scientists, from, from units and from limiting cases, we already know some details about this function. So we say, so, so. Right, we know initial conditions or limiting cases. We know at t equals zero, x might better be x naught. So from that, I figured out already that this function, I'm guessing this function has the form This is our conjecture so far. Okay, the first term I'm saying, I'm calling X naught right now, sometimes in the math homework. In other contexts, we call a capital A for amplitude. Same thing. It just depends context what you want to say. X naught is when you're emphasizing that it's the first displacement. A is when you're emphasizing that it's the biggest displacement, but it's the same thing. Okay, that's that term. And this is my guess. I have not proved it yet. Honestly, actually, we already proved it last week, but I'm not proving that's right. I'm showing you where it comes from. And again, I'm just going to repeat one reason we're doing this for so long is I know in my, I feel in my heart that we spend a lot of time in classrooms telling you why the right answer is the right answer. But really, at least whenever I'm a student, 
I'm often thinking like, I see why the right answer is the right answer. And even when I'm studying, I'm like, all right, I get why that works. But then there's, that's it. But then I'm always like, but I don't know how I would have done that on my own. Or maybe I don't even think that. I'm just like, oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. And then I have to go to the, because I'm like reading and the notes make sense. And the professor like, this is why it makes sense. So I'm like, oh, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. And then I go to the exam and then they're asking me to do it. And I'm like, well, I, I, I mean, well, I, I didn't come up with that. I mean, you came up with that. Like I bought it, but now you want me to sell it? Like what? And right. And, and this is particularly tricky because I'm showing you we're, we're trying to solve differential equations, or at least the ones we want. We're trying to show ourselves that the guesses work. But I think it's very reasonable, it's very necessary that you engage in the question, where did these guesses come from in the first place? I'm showing you. Are you going to have to come up with your own guesses? Sometimes, yes, but not for wildly different equations. For very, equations that are very similar to this, you're going to have to come up with very similar guesses, okay? It's, it's not crazy town. But you're going to have to know these guesses well enough to know where they came from and the logic of it. So that's where the X naught came from. Now, let's talk. I haven't proved it's right. I'm just telling you where it came from. And I've told you where the cosine came from. Now, let me talk about this thing. This is the big deal. I mean, this is the heart. I, well, whatever. This is the nub of the gist right here, I think. Okay. Now, I, okay. So like a big focus of this class right now, we've got 35 minutes left is I want to explain to you what I mean by this Omega thing. Now, let, and I don't think this is a joke. Like I, th I think it is super important. And, and already, if you've already done lab three, which I think a lot of you have, I can't remember. I get the lab sections confused. If you've already done lab three, you've already had to like leap through this Omega thing and pass and do this whole other thing. Believe me, I know. And you're, and you might've already had to convince yourself that you've accepted and gotten comfortable with Omega. But I know from experience that you, that doesn't mean you are or that you have a, that you should be comfortable with it yet. I'm backing up now and trying to unpack this Omega thing. Now, the first thing I'm saying about Omega, the first thing you got to know is it's just a Greek letter. I mean, don't be intimidated by the fact that it's Greek. We could have called it anything. You can call it anything in your notes. It, but the first thing to know is it's just a constant. It's just a constant. It's a number that won't change throughout the process of some oscillation or throughout the solution of some differential equation. It's a So it's a constant, first of all. So first of all, it's just a constant, okay? But Okay. We know that this omega is measuring radians per second. It is like it's the constant value that represents the rate of radians per second. It's how many radians something is like passing through or undergoing per unit time. Now, first of all, a radian is a unit of measurement that we use when we're measuring the size of an angle. So somehow, somehow this omega thing is measuring some rate of sweeping through angles per unit time. That is confusing. I mean, ultimately it's like totally all makes sense. I'm hopefully gonna show you, but if, if, 
you might first bump because it's a Greek letter. But then if you start thinking about this Greek letter and you think that it means radians per second, I don't know how you feel about radians, but if you're like me, somewhere in your brain, you might be going, all right, radians, angles. Like, I guess I get that because it's like trig and it's like cosine, so angles. But but I'm looking at something that's going back and forth and back and forth. I could even imagine how there'd be some rate that we're talking about with something going back and forth. But where the heck are the angles? I don't know if you're consciously thinking that or not. I would suggest that you do consciously think about it because... If you're just unconsciously, if you're not consciously bothered by it, you can't ever like unravel this. We are, omega is some rate of oscillation. It's the rate at which we're oscillating through some kind of angle. Even though I don't physically see any angle in a straight back and forth X axis through which like some mass is springing, right? So where's the angle? What are these radians? What are we talking about? What I want to remind you is Here's the deal. There's a reason all of a sudden with something going back. And I want to get, wait, actually, no, that's one. Yeah, I'm going to stop for one sec. I'm not stopping, but I, this is important enough. I just what I'm about to get into. Okay, here, here's the issue. I'm going to ask you, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to ask a question in the chat, but I'm going to ask you to like show that you're paying attention in a minute. Okay, let me just summarize again where we are. I'm trying to show what this omega, this omega thing is going to come up for the rest of our lives. It, it already, you've seen it re, get, get, getting ugly in the lab already, I believe. It do, the omega doesn't go away. Omega, as in cosine of omega times T, omega is some kind of measurement of radians per second. What I want to explain to you right now is why radians per second have anything to do with something going back and forth in a straight line, okay? Like, I believe, Everybody can get this as long as they know that that's what the issue is. But I also believe that most, a lot of people, in, including me in the past and other people in the past, don't ever sort of break through the Omega wall because they never really realized what the wall was. I think the wall is that we are look, we're trying to analyze something, go back. We're trying to analyze something that's going straight back and forth, straight back and forth along an X axis. And somehow from here on in, we're going to analyze it in terms of radians per second. And radians have something to do with angles. So I think what needs to be explained here is what angles have to do with this. And by the way, you might even, if you're with me, and I'm going to ask you in a second if you are, so it's time to like, like get back from the bathroom or whatever. If you're with me, you might even be thinking something like, well, they have to do with it because you need radians to do cosines. And cosines have something to do with this because we're going back and forth and back and forth. And if you're thinking anything like that, good. Yes, yes, you're, you're with me. That's true. But still, we got to connect the dots fully. Like, how is it that we could take the cosine of something called a radian and have that have anything to do with something's going straight back and forth, straight back and forth? Like, where's the angles is really the ultimate question here. And I, I'm not asking you. I mean, if anybody wants to put in the chat, I'll give you that. If you want to put in the chat directly or indirect or publicly, like what a radian has to do with something going back and forth, back and forth, I would love to hear it. But I'm not challenging you with that because I think it's tricky. What I'm just going to ask you right now is please raise your electronic hand if you are with me right now, if you know what the issue is that I'm about to like try to explain. Awesome, Gianna, that was fast. Thank you, Gianna. Who, that's one person. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Nicholas. That's one, three people. 
Okay, I'm going to say again, please, this is the time to tune in. Thank you, Samuel. And again, this is not a test. This is an opportunity. I'm saying, like, let's come together here because it's about to get all real up in here. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Abdel, thank you. Brooke, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Amy Kanina. That's that's good. That's a quorum. Thank you, Diana. Okay, that's a quorum. Good. Okay. So it's an opportunity to regroup. Okay. That's awesome. I mean, that's not everybody. Don't, I mean, I, it's not certain people, but it's enough people. All right. So what I'm here to say, and, and hopefully this is going to break through a little bit of a trig block, maybe, which will help us with the calculus block, maybe for some of you. And if it's all boring and old news, forgive me, but honestly, my heart of hearts, I believe that even if it is old news to you, it's not. Um, if you want to know, here's the deal. Angles are not, this is not an angle. I mean, it is an angle. Hold on, I'm gonna change the view so I can do this. Hold on one second. Okay. I always used to think that this was an angle. I mean, it is an angle, but it's the wrong way to think about an angle. I used to always think an angle is an intersection between two lines. And if one person says, I mean, if they say that this angle is bigger than this angle, they say measure this angle or measure this angle, they're saying something about how far apart these two lines are or how far apart these lines are. And if they say this one's bigger than this one, they're saying that this angle, like is that these two lines are more far apart than these two. Now, none of that is wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying if I think that, if that's what I'm picturing when I picture angles, I'm ne I'm going to be blocked for the rest of my life. Like I'm never going to break through the wall. And that is me. That was me. For the longest time, I thought angle, this. Big angle, this. And it's not wrong, but it's totally unhelpful. It misses the whole point. of it. Because specifically, if I think that this is a big angle because there's a lot of space between my two hands, it, and if I think, oh, when people measure this angle and say it's like 72 degrees, they mean somehow there's 72 somethings between my two hands, that totally begs the whole question of, well, wait a second. First of all, how are you measuring what's between your two hands? If you're saying there's 72 something because like you dropped a line from one hand to the other and it was like 72 like notches on that line, then aren't you just freaking talking about distance? Like, how is that an angle? If you're saying that this hand is 72 meh, like inches or cubits or millimeters or something or fingernails from the other hand, then why do you just say that? Like, what's diff why are you using degrees and ratings and all this nonsense if you're just talking about how far something is from something else, right? That's number one, because we're not, it turns out. We're not just talking about dropping some line from one hand to the other. First of all, we're talking about opening up my hands in a certain way so that what I drop from one hand to the other is some sort of arc. Huh? What? Yeah, I know, right? It's already a little bit weird. We're not dropping a straight line. We're dropping like an arc or something. I don't know why. Yes, I do. I will explain it in a minute. But second of all, even if you sort of get that, then when you're talking about angles and that whole angle symbol that you make the like little arc between the two lines, even if you get, okay, no, the size of the angle is like how big that arc is between the two. Then the next question is, well, wait a second. Like, doesn't it make all the difference like where I put that arc? I mean, I mean, this angle, sorry, th this angle looks bigger than this angle. But if I put that arc way out here on this angle and I just draw it way in close on this angle, I'm going to, like if I go out far enough, this thing, this hand is farther away than that hand. If I go out far enough compared to these two, so where do I even put that arc? What is this whole like measurement of an angle procedure that leads me to know what a 72 angle degree is or something, right? I'm saying, I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm trying to teach something by unteaching something. I'm trying to say that the first misconception of angles is that what we're really picturing is how far two lines are apart from each other. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about the size of an angle. The, what an angle is, what an angle is, maybe you know, I think you will know this when you hear it. But I'm not, I'm not even, I mean, if you want, I'm going just slow enough that if you want to take the risk or whatever and put in the chat what you think I'm about to say, I of course would be thrilled. I'm not going to force anybody, but like what is actually an angle? It's not the distance between two lines. What an angle, so if you want to put in the chat and give it a shot, please go right ahead. But I'll tell you what I think. An angle is a fraction, as in a portion of a circle 
That's what an angle is. Let me be very specific. Forget about degrees, forget about radians, all that for a, sem for a second. Ah, what the name? Sorry. Let's be very specific for a second. Everybody recognizes a right angle. Everybody knows what a right angle is. And it doesn't, and a lot of us know that it's called a 90 degree angle in our kind of stupid Western system of degrees, which I'll get into in a second. Like we know. It's called a 90 degree angle. If you're a little bit more advanced in math, maybe you know it's called pi over two radians. Other cultures and other mathematical systems have other like terms for it. And you could call it perpendicularity. But here's the thing. Everybody recognizes a right angle. The, the, the angle between my two hands right now is like, ba sorry, is basically right. Now it's not right. Now it basically is right. Now it's not right. And you would recognize that no matter how long my hands are. Right. And you would recognize that whether we said 90 degrees or pi over two or whatever, I made up a new system and I was like, it's called like 13 Yavers. Right. You recognize a right angle. So does my eight year old son, because what are you actually recognizing? You're recognizing that it's a fourth of a circle. Right. Let me go a step further. My son, who's eight and I'm not making fun of him, but I mean, he's eight. He doesn't know trig or any of this kind of stuff, but he freaking knows what a 360 no scope is. And he says it all the time, right? 360, 360 no scope. Actually, I don't really know what a 360 no scope is. Some Fortnite thing. But like, right? But he knows what a 360 is. If he sees someone on a skateboard do a 360, he's like, whoa, 360. And he knows just enough math to know what a 180 is. It's half of a 360. What is he recognizing when he's impressed by someone doing a 360? He's knowing that it's a full circle, right? That's the right idea. Like, and the idea that you understand degrees and 360s is because from a really early age, everybody can recognize circles and circle portions. And from an early age, we slapped this system of numbers on it with 360s and 180s that you got used to and memorized. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'll explain. The 360 thing doesn't literally make any sense, but you think, we think it does because we're so used to it. The thing that makes sense, the thing that we know is that an angle is a portion of a circle. There's a full circle, there's half circles, there's quarter circles, which are called right angles. There's eighth of a circle, which you call 45 degree angle or whatever, right? And the thing about poor, so first of all, I'm saying an angle. So when you talk about two lines intersecting, what we're really picturing is, we're, when we picture two lines intersecting, you're picturing a slice of pizza. And what you're really picturing is what portion of the whole pizza is that? If you picture two lines intersecting like this, you're saying, God dang, sorry, I can't do it in front of the mirror. Like it's so awkward. But if you've pictured that, what you're picturing no matter, is that no matter how long my hands are, you know that if that was a slice of pizza, you'd share it with three other friends. That's a stupid metaphor, but you know it's a fourth of a pizza. And you know it no matter how big the pizza is, no matter how long my hands are, right? What we're getting at is I'm saying, that an angle, whoop, hello. An angle is a fraction of a circle, is a recognizable fraction of a circle. And it's a fraction that is recognizable. Independent of the circle's size. This is the issue of what an angle is. Now, 112. 
The way we express angles in the purest form is just this way, is to think of an angle as just as literally a fraction, as in a ratio. What an angle is, and I know you've seen this a million times and you've memorized this in math, but if you're like me, I memorized it, but it never had any meaning for me. I never knew what, I just thought it was arbitrary. The definition of an angle is how much crust you get of the pizza per per unit radius of that pizza. Like it's a pure fraction. Notice, wait, sir. If X, or, or, or sorry, maybe you use S in math class, S for arc length I'm talking about. It doesn't matter if, it doesn't matter if you use X or S, but I'm saying arc length. Mm -hmm. To say that you have a big angle is to say that you got a lot of a circle. What does that mean, a lot of circle? It means a lot of the circle, a lot of the crust of the pizza. The big, if we all were dealing with the same circle, if we all knew the size of our pizza, then a bigger angle would mean more crust, right? To put more specifically, a 180 degree angle out of a pizza, a half circle on a pizza, would be specifically, directly, two times as much crust as a 90 degree slice. A 180 degree slice, a semicircle slice would, of pizza would have twice as much crust as a 90 degree slice. And what would be reckoned, and it doesn't matter if you call it 180 or 90 or right or too right or whatever, what you're talking about is how much crust do you get for that pizza, for that pizza. So it's how much crust do you get in meters Per every you every meter of radius that that pizza afforded you in the first place. That is to say, so I'm saying angle is just cross length, really. Angle is portion of circle, which really translates into how much of the circle did you go around? How much crust did you get? But we say per radius divided by radius, we to allow for the fact to capture this beautiful fact that. If someone comes along and makes a pizza twice as big, like twice as big of a radius, of course, automatically they're getting too much. They're getting twice as much crust for every bit of angle that they choose, right? Like, in other words, automatically a fourth of a pizza that's cut from a two meter radius pizza is, of course, twice as big as the as an as the crust of a 90 degree pizza slice cut from a one meter radius pizza. I didn't say that well at all, but I'm saying if you double the radius of a pizza, of course you're gonna get two times as much crust automatically before you even start cutting slices. So we're normalizing the situation. We're saying what angle is, is just really how much crust you get, but per each unit of radius that you already have. If we're all looking at the same circle and we all let's call it radius one, then bigger angles are bigger crust lengths, bigger arc lengths and vice versa. So notice that angle is a pure ratio. It's meters divided by meters. It literally is a fraction. It is how much of this are you getting per that? A right angle is a fourth of a circle. And by the way, that's all the Greeks called it. They didn't call it, they did all this math, this trigonometry, this astronomy, this intensely sophisticated math in 400 BC. And they, they didn't quite know cosines and sines, but they knew like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pythagorean theorem for sure, and all that stuff. They didn't have a ninety degree. They didn't have a system of degrees, and they they just called a right angle a fourth of a circle, and like it worked because that's what it is. Now, why do we? Call, where's radians come from? It comes from this. If you're gonna, and and by the way, I apologize to any of you who think that you already know all this, and you're like, wait, isn't this like seventh grade math or something? Yes, in a way, but the key is how does this all link up to cosines and oscillators? I I feel like this is worth relooking at so that you can see why oscillators are described in terms of cosines, which are functions of radians. What does any of that have to do with this? We're just about there, and we have 14 minutes, so we're just about there. Where we're just about there is saying.
Right. Okay, say so you have a full, you have a circle of radius R. Like I don't know, radius called R. What angle, what, what, what is a 360? What does it mean to do the full circle? What angle is that? Well, according to this definition, the arc length around a full circle is its circumference, two pi r and if you divide and so that's that's the arc length measured in meters would be two pi times r and then if you divide out the radius just in case its radius happens to be bigger than one meter but right, if you divide out the r's you divide out the meters and what you get is this pure number two pi now what does it mean what am i saying First of all, I'm saying this is why we love circles, because there's this thing about circles that's interesting. This is what pi is all about. I don't care that, for the moment, I don't care that pi is like a weird number that's 3.14159. Like, yes, it's interesting that the number goes on forever without repeat or pat. But even more interesting than that is that it's a number at all. The first thing we're saying about pi, or specifically 2 pi, is that no matter what size circle you take, if you wrap a string around a tree and then you put the string down on the ground and then you cut straight through the tree and put and put a string there and put that string down on the ground you'll fit a, a certain number of small strings into the big strings going around the tree is a little bit more than 3 times as much as going straight across the tree and apparently that ratio is true regardless of how big the tree is the first thing we're saying about pi or whatever is that there's a constant ratio between going around and going across, no matter how big a circle it is. So to go around a whole circle from here on in, we're going to call, we're going to name after that ratio. We're going to say a full circle is like, is, is, sorry, is two pi radians. I am saying like you learned in 10th grade math or whatever, two pi radians is a 360 from now on. And it's the direct, you learned it later, so you're less used to it, but it actually is way more direct than saying 360. Why did we divide a circle into 360 parts? I'll tell you why. Because there's because it there's about 360 of these in every one of these when you're talking about the Earth going around the sun. Like, honestly, that's why. Are you thinking of astronomy anytime you draw a circle on a piece of paper or look at a mass, a mass oscillating on a spring? No. Like, I love astronomy. Some of my best friends are astronomy. I read you that book. I love astronomy. But I, that, that, but so that's historically super cool. But that's completely indirect. That doesn't help me with a circle on a piece of paper on my desk. On a P or or in a lab. What I want to drum in right now with nine minutes left is that there are two pi radians to a full circle. That's what you want to know for the rest of your life from here on in, that there's two pi radians to a full circle. What does that mean? What does that have to do with masses and springs? It has this. First of all, so I'm going to say this. Repeat the key, if you're still with me, and I know either for some of you, I went like way too fast. And some of you were like, dude, I knew that in seventh grade. I really can't believe that you're wasting my time with this right now. I understand that. But here's the thing I think a lot of us did not know in seventh grade. 
In the end of the day, if you understand that two pi radians constitute a full circle, and you understand that circles are circles regardless of their size, that we can talk about sections of circles regardless of their size, then the, that allows us to talk about cycles because cycles are the same thing. Cyc cyclical behavior is cyclical predictable pattern behavior regardless of the size in space of the cycle. So from now on, I say there's two pi radians to a full cycle. When we're looking at something going, there's no angles in this. There's no angles. What there is, is cycles. What I'm saying is that an angle is a portion of something cyclical. I, when we start talking about omega being measured in radians per second, and we're like, what the heck is a radian? At the end of the day, a radian is a sixth of a cycle. That's what it is. It's not exactly a six. It's approximately a six. But it is exactly that in meaning. Like the number isn't perfectly a six. But when you're picturing what we're talking about radians, what we're talking, there's about six radians in the cycle. Where did I get six? There's two pi radians in the cycle. And pi is just a number. It's like a little bit more than three. It's just a number. It's a weird number, but it's not its own unit. It's not its own concept. It's just a number that's a little bit more than three. So when I say there's two pi radians in a cycle. I'm saying that there's just like you think of a cycle as 360 degrees. I'm saying from here on in, think of it as about six radians. A cycle is six radians. What is a radian? A sixth of a cycle. So that omega term, honestly, if you're going to memorize anything from any of this, note I am yelling. I am totally yelling. Come back from the other room, whatever, whatever you're doing. A radian is a sixth of a cycle. When we talk about omega being a measurement of radians per second, from here on in, omega having units of radians per second, from now on, we're gonna call omega angular frequency. And by that, we mean how frequently an oscillator is passing through or undergoing or completing angles. And when we think about angles from now on, we're going to be thinking of sections of cycles. Then, like, literally, if we say something has an angular frequency of two pi radians per second, we're saying that it's doing one cycle per second and therefore that it takes one cycle to complete. Uh, excuse me, and therefore it takes one second to complete a cycle. Okay. In other words, We're going to, I, I know we've got three minutes. I'm just going to, I just gave you like four new equations, right? I mean, it seems like, but they're all different. They're all equivalent ways of saying the same thing. I am saying, okay. I'm saying from now on, omega, that term in the code, what that omega is, is how rapidly the cosine function is cycling. If you make, if omega is just one, you have like a normal cosine graph. If you make omega a bigger and bigger number, you'll have, you'll have still a cosine shape, but you'll have more and more bumps, more and more crests, if you like, per unit on the x-axis, per unit time, because that's what we're measuring on the x-axis, right? Omega is how rapidly the cosine function cycles. The cosine function itself uh, takes in radians, sections of circles. Once we multiply it by t, we're talking about actual cycles in actual time and in time, right? So I'm saying if we define from here on in f, lowercase f, to be standard frequency, like number of cycles that something does in a second, like I undergo, like this mass is doing 50 round trips per second. 
right? 50 cycles per second. I don't know how big the cycles are, but I know it's doing 50 cycles per second. From now on, we would say it has a standard frequency F of 50 cycles per second. And from now on, we're going to define one cycle per second to be one hertz. So we would say something's going back and forth at 50 hertz if it's doing 50 round trips per second. I'm saying here that the, if the math takes in omega, omega is angular frequency, not standard frequency, angular frequency. It's just the same concept. We're just measuring cycles, but we're measuring them in angular terms. We're remembering that if you're thinking about angle as a section of a circle or a cycle, we're just remembering that for every one cycle, there's two pi radians, like one cycle, the converted factor, if you like conversion factor, one cycle equals two pi radians. One radian is one sixth of a cycle. So from now on, if someone says, oh, it's got an angular frequency of two pi radian, uh, excuse me, four pi radians per second, we would look down here. We would say, oh, it's got an angular frequency of two pi radians per second. I'll divide by two pi and say, oh, it's do, sorry, if we say it's like four pi radians per second, we would divide by two pi and say, oh, it's doing two cycles per second, two hertz of standard frequency oscillation. And if it's doing two hertz, if it's doing two cycles per second, that means its period is one half second per cycle. Cycles per second is frequency. Reciprocal of that is period, seconds per cycle. And omega is angular frequency. It's that concept, but, but measured in radians. The re relationship between radians and cycles is that there's two pi radians in every cycle. A radian is a two pi of a cycle. It's about a sixth of a cycle. That's what a radian is. Um, so that's what that term, that's where that guess came from. That's what that guess means. That guess turns out to be right. We actually proved it last week, but we'll prove it on Wednesday. So that's good enough for today. Okay, Have, um, you've been very patient. I hope this is sort of clear. Um, I will see you on Wednesday. Have a good yes, good afternoon, or have a good afternoon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Goodbye.